minutes. Um, we've got a couple of people in the breakout rooms who are on their way back, I hope, and we're closing those rooms and a couple of people may be joining. So if you want to go ahead and share your screen and uh, you're coming across very clearly, so I think we're good. Excellent. So yeah. I have to use the Zoom web browser right now because my Zoom is crashing my computer. I hope this works. Okay, no, this is fine. Okay. Maybe, uh, maybe as we're giving those people a couple of minutes, you just reminded me of, uh, I guess it was around this time of year when I was in Zurich um, a few years back and I was on the tram on my way back to the airport and I, I had plenty of time for my pl flight. Uh, I think I'd left plenty of time and uh, seemed to be on track and all of a sudden I seemed to be heading the wrong way on the tram. And uh, I got off the tram and I got back onto the right track and I started going in the right direction for the airport again. And I heard an announcement and most people got off and I stayed on the train and again, I didn't seem to manage to get to the airport and I was going in the wrong direction. And I think I did this for a third time before I realized that the announcement was telling me there was some sort of a breakdown. <laughs> oh dear. Eventually realized, figured out how I could get to the, the airport. But uh, a very interesting experience. <laughs> well, you got very lucky because usually everything runs smooth yeah. as clockwork here, but somehow you managed to hit one of the rare disruptions. Ab absolutely. But at least there are three different ways of getting to the airport. It's not like Dublin when you're stuck with the bus, you can take the tram <laughs> or the train or the bus to the airport. So it's unlikely that they'll all be disrupted at the same time. Absolutely. Okay, but it definitely look. helps if you can understand the announcements. Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, I think we have everyone left, so um, I'll uh, pass over to you maybe before I do that. So if I could introduce you quickly. So uh, Johannes, we have Johannes, I'm very pleased to introduce from ETH Zurich. So Johannes is a PhD student in Torsten and Hoffler's group. His research topics include things like spatial computing, HPC systems, programming models, applications, libraries, and enhanced programming productivity. And you'll see he'll present on dates, it's data centric FPGA programming. And incidentally, uh, Johannes runs some really excellent HLS tutorials. If you ever have an opportunity to follow one of these tutorials, I definitely recommend it. But for now, I'll pass over to you. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you bring it up. We we are actually planning to put it on YouTube shortly. It's all recorded and um, well, we just need to do a little bit of editing. But uh, we've, we've been doing them at, at conferences and we figured given the current situation where we can't go to conferences anyway, this was an excellent time to, to finally compile and upload everything. Um, so I can give some quick pointers to, to the tutorial at the end of this, um, but there's also a bunch of, of code examples and a Git repository to follow and uh, a lot of material out there. So for those of you who are interested in doing HPC-oriented things with HLS, um, I recommend, recommend checking it out. So what, what's different about our tutorial than many other tutorials is that we're very HPC focused because that's what we do in our lab. So if that's what you're into, um, I recommend checking it out. But uh, let's get started with the presentation then. So uh, Kale invited me to come and talk about DACE. So DACE somehow stands for Data Centric Parallel Programming. It's a poor of an acronym as most other computer science acronyms as you can imagine. Days is, if you Google it, a fish, but it's unfortunately a very pathetic fish. It's not even a cool fish. So I don't know how that happened. But anyway, it stands for data centric. So this is the work of a lot of people from my lab. Um, the FPJ aspect of Days is primarily me and my colleague Tiziano, but there are many, many people involved, uh, 20 plus at this point. So um, the mandatory, this is obviously not just my work. Um, so the alternative title here is how you can get teraflop floating point performance on FPGAs using nothing but Python. Um, obviously, that is the most clickbaity way I can put it, but it's nevertheless true. Uh, and maybe that will get you interested in, in some of the approaches that we're taking here. Um, so this was born out of an observation that if this is your input program and now you want to make this fast and you go about optimizing it, then typically this is your output program or rather your optimized program. And I should know because I wrote the code here on the right. And 
while it's hard to avoid your program becoming large once it's optimized, that's sort of in the nature of things. Um, what is particularly unfortunate now is that if I want to go and change this program, if I want to go and, and edit this somehow, um, add an extra, uh, add some extra computations, uh, change the outputs, do something, then changing the code on the right becomes very, very difficult once it's in an optimized state. And this was also concerns we heard from our colleagues working at the um, scientific research institutions that they had this issue that once their code was optimized, especially going to GPUs and things like this, it basically became impossible for the scientists who actually knew what the original code did to go and, and modify anything on the scientific level. So um, DAIS has this concept of separation of concerns, which was our philosophy from the beginning, which is basically that we consider this process of writing an HPC program as something that involves two distinct jobs or roles, which is the domain scientist, which is who's someone that knows what the physics are whatever what the actual problem we're trying to solve is and a performance engineer who's the one that knows how to optimize programs so your hpc expert if you will and these are roles meaning they can in principle be the same person if you are the one who writes your program and you want to optimize it you are both the domain scientist and a performance engineer but conceptually we want to separate these two things so that they don't sort of interfere with each other um, so a brief overview of everything that DAIS is. Uh, I don't expect you to be able to understand in depth what all of this is because there's a lot of material here and you will be very bored. I'm going to focus more on trying to motivate and sort of advertise a bit why you might be interested in learning more about this, but just give a quick overview first. Um, we have these two roles that we cater to, the domain scientist and the performance engineer. And the idea is that the domain scientist gets to formulate their problem in some productive manner. So some, some Python-based uh, interface, this can be a domain-specific language and could be one of the many machine learning, machine learning frameworks such as PyTorch or TensorFlow, um, or even write these graphs manually if they want to, which is then fed into some scientific front end, which is provided by the, by the DAIS framework. This is then converted into this uh, data-centric intermediate representation. I'll talk a little bit about it in a second, but basically a graph-based representation, which is where uh, the optimizations are supposed to happen. Optimizations are then done via graph transformations. So we basically take this representation that comes out of the front end and we apply graph transformations to, to turn it from a slow program into a faster program, but maintaining the same semantics as the input program. And then finally, this graph is then uh, passed over to a system where it's compiled, given the certain hardware target that you have, and then emitting CPU binaries, GPU binaries, or FPGA bitstreams, which will then give you some performance information, which you can go back to and, and continue optimizing your program. So this is a lot of things. This is front ends. This is a intermediate representation optimization framework, and it's a runtime system. Um, so I'll focus mostly on the things that, that I think are cool and relevant from the FPGA context um, for the rest of the talk. So the performance engineer has to work with these uh, STFGs. So now I'm gonna very briefly introduce you to what this sort of overall concept is. Again, I don't expect you to uh, fully understand everything that's going on here, but just want to, to give you a feel for what the, um, what the sort of philosophy here is. So if you have a computation within this STFG representation, every comp computation is wrapped in this octagonal scope, which we call um, octagonal, octagonal node, which we call a tasklet. And we call the tasklet because the idea is that we want to take every computation and make it as fine grained as possible in order to give us as much space to optimize as possible. So this is, a, this is a computation that you should imagine operates on a single data element, right? A single index of an array. We then have data nodes, which are these um, circles or ovals that represent the data in the program. So in this case, we would have an input X and uh, an output Y. And these edges that go between 
My headset decided to run out of battery just now. Do you hear me fine? Yeah, we can hear you. Great, sorry about that. Luckily, I have a hot swappable battery. All right, so then the, the edges that connect the data nodes and the computation nodes are called memlets. Again, lets because we're talking about the finest granularity possible that moves between our data containers and the computational nodes. So um, that's, of course, that's that's all good. But but if we need to move to something that has parallelism in it, because the whole point here is to do high performance stuff. So now when we want to apply this computation to multiple elements, then the way this would sort of represent it in a pure graph format is you would have a bunch of, 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 of these memlets that move between the data containers A and B here, um, two different instantiations of this tasklet, where each of them will compute on A0, or A1, or A something up to N minus one, and then write back to a certain location. And to capture this, we have a concept of um, these uh, scopes. So essentially parallelism, parametric parallelism is captured in the graph with, with these scope nodes that represent an entry into a, a parallel scope and an exit out of a parallel scope. So the, the right-hand side here essentially encapsulates the left-hand side by saying that for every index uh, i between zero and n, we compute something, whatever is in this tasklet, on these inputs, uh, A of I, and, and output into this B of I. And very important thing here is that every memory access that happens in the program is explicit. So no memory can be touched unless it's represented in the graph and using these, uh, using these memory edges. All right, and then finally, in order to be able to represent anything, these, uh, these sort of sections here which are data flow sections they can be plugged into states which can have control flow between them so each of the states um, contain a pure data flow section and then around the states we have some control flow and this sort of nested data flow control flow can then be arbitrarily nested within each other so each each node can again contain more control flow that can contain more data flow and so on so we can represent uh, anything within this and that was sort of just sort of to give you a rough idea of, of of what what the representation about but essentially the the core concept is to have parametric parallelism through these maps explicit uh, data movement through these data containers and data edges so all memory access is managed um, and then control flow to represent anything that is not within uh, that is not pure data flow essentially. So this is what the performance engineer has to work with. He gets some some graph in. So the the graph you see here on the right hand side is a screenshot of a systolic array matrix multiplication implementation. So this is basically an FPGA uh, systolic array matrix matrix multiplication implementation that's done. Uh, using one of the day's Python APIs. And within this state, each of these states, we have pure data flow. And as you can imagine, this is uh, a good match for, for FPGAs. So this is a CPU, GPU, FPGA. It's a, it's a framework for, for any architecture. But FPGAs are very naturally represented, representable because we have a lot of data flow that sort of um, comes out of the representation. So we use these pure data flow sections to map them to FPGA programs. And all data movement is explicit, like I mentioned. So every one of these edges represents some data moving throughout the program, which also means that we can very easily capture um, the different kinds of data movements you have on an FPGA. As, as you have uh, for sure discovered by now, on an FPGA, it's not as easy as just, um, I want this memory location now, and then some centralized memory system gives it to you. But rather, you have to always think about where does my memory come from? Uh, when do I access global memory? How do I store it in on-chip buffers, move it throughout FIFOs, and so on? So the fact that all data movement is explicit means that this, again, maps very well to the FPJ world because we we have captured all of this in the representation and can therefore use that to code generate from. So we take a graph like this, and then it goes through one of our, our code generation backends, and essentially you uh, get out some HLS code. So this is generated HLS code, which will eventually be synthesized um, to your bitstream. And uh, this is the code that you then never actually have to touch um, with all the correct pragmas and, and um, kinds of buffers, instantiated memory accesses, and so on. 
And then uh, I mentioned the, the optimization process is then via these graph transformations. And um, this is now just another representation, another way of, of, uh, of writing FPJ programs, but now I'll just go through a few of the motivating reasons for why, why this is cool from the FPGA point of view. So first I wanna talk about a few different graph transformations that, um, that are cool in the, in the context of FPGAs. So one is offloading. Like I mentioned, this is not an FPGA framework. This is a general HPC framework. So if your input program is uh, something that lives on the CPU or lives on an unspecified place, um, I have an example here on the left, which is two BLAS operations in a row. There's an XP operation, a dot operation. They work on some, some memories. Then these graph transformations can, for example, take this program and just offload it to the FPGA. So the way that works is because all our data is explicitly represented in the graph, we know exactly what will be loaded from, from off-chip memory. So we can instantiate a phase before we start our kernel that copies all the data to the FPGA. So doing the OpenCL mem copies in the, in the case of Vitus, um, moving from these, these host arrays that are input to the program X, Y, and W and copying them to some FPGA equivalents that was created by the transformation. Then in the computation itself, all the memories have been replaced with these new FPGA memories that we created. And then finally, we can copy the data back again. And this is really just going from the left-hand side to right-hand side is one click of a button, um, one transformation that goes and detects all these memories and creates these states for you. And with the generated code, you will then also have all the memory management taken care of for you. So uh, copies from, um, from the host of the device back again and the uh, launch of the kernel, launch of the bitstream, instantiating the essentially the bitstream, loading the kernel, setting the OpenCL arguments, all this stuff is basically, basically just happens in that the right-hand side here is something that resides on the FPGA. So another cool transformation is something we made recently is extracting memory accesses. So as you have perhaps also learned now, is um, it's a very good idea to access off-chip memory separately from the computation itself, because then we can prefetch and uh, and get uh, as much memory bandwidth as possible without constantly waiting for something happening later in the computation. So this is another transformation that you can do. So on, uh, on the left-hand side, we have these different accesses here to uh, X, Y, and the result. And another transformation basically takes these, pulls them out, instantiates them as separate processing elements where each of the processing elements reads from this memory, pushes it into a stream, and then the stream is read from the, from the computational kernel. So the generated code will give you some of these separate processing element modules that basically just take memory and, and read according to some pattern into, uh, into FIFOs that are then read by the kernel itself. And um, another cool transformation is, is streaming between different things. So um, as you've also learned now, the, the real source of performance in FPGAs is when you can build these very deep pipelines where you can stream between as many computations as possible. So in this example here on the left, we had an XP operation that writes the memory and then is read by a dot operation. And this is again a transformation we can we can apply to this where these are split into two separate uh, processing elements. So these two XP and dot become these two uh, components over here where the XP operation and the dot operation, they're operating fully in parallel and communicating uh, via FIFO. Um, so, if you're wondering on the right hand side here, we have these separate components. Essentially, whenever there's a component that is not attached to anything else, it means that this is an independent processing element. So these are scheduled in parallel. And in fact, this is the case um, no matter where you run it. So if you run this on a CPU, these could be open MP threads and on the FPGA, these are processing elements. All right, so those are some of the few um, graph transformations that are particularly FPGA related. There are also loads of transformations that are general, like um, applying tiling, for example, and inserting buffers, which is not specific to FPGAs, but that we can also apply within this framework. Um, but now I'll talk a little bit about the code generation aspect. So regardless of the input language and how you do all these optimizations, another very powerful use case of days is that it has uh, a code generator behind it. Um, and this has this has quite a lot of benefits. Um, for example, all the automatic pragma insertion like I showed you before, but in general, it, it 
um, the code generator knows how to instantiate, how to emit code in a way that the HLS compiler likes. Um, this can be challenging, as you probably know. So by having this very structured format that, that you are enforced to have through the SDFG representation, we can emit this very efficient code that has the correct pragmas and that's annotated the correct way, but also um, just has the right structure for the for the compiler to be able to process it well. But not only that, um, so this example I showed you here was um, where we emit Vivado HLS, but we do also, and uh, I'm sorry about this, I know this is a siling school, but we do in fact also emit Intel OpenCL, uh, which means that you can now write your program and as long as you only use these general days constructs, you can essentially take the same program and emit either Sidelinks or Intel code and compile it for either architecture. This is in particular very interesting for us as researchers because we we want to use whatever is available to us. Um, whoever has currently has the newest, coolest FPJ, we can just compile it for that vendor and, and go and run it. And um, I can tell you this actually works fairly well. Definitely doesn't work. It's not fully performance portable in the sense that um, some differences between the vendors are not just a question of uh, emitting slightly different syntax, but really require the structure to be quite different. Um, Intel has this concept of shift registers, for example, which doesn't exist in Siling. So this is something that you need to target more specifically. But as a at least as a first approximation, this this works fairly well, and you can really um, take your code, compile it for either vendor and get, get good results. And then apart from the fact that one is C++ and the other is, is OpenCL, we of course also, uh, we can now take care of all these pragmas that are specific to each of the vendors. So the pragmas look in one way in Silings, another way in Intel. Intel doesn't use pipeline pragmas at all, so they can be emitted and so on. And you can also see there are some rather unfortunate problems with OpenCL on the right here we have a little define when we need to have a reference to a channel because you cannot have references in OpenCL. And we actually, th this is taken directly from the code. We actually emit God save us every time we do this, just to make it very clear for anyone that reads the code that we wish we could do something else. Uh, and then the way we, we operate with channels is also code generated correctly. So uh, on Silings, when you work with FIFOs, they are uh, objects that are instantiated within your top level functions. Whereas Intel, there are these crazy floating global objects that um, you need to access as, as global objects. And this is also all taken care of from the framework side. All right. And then there's the question of boilerplate. So I imagine so far, if you needed to run an FPGA program, you probably took one of the existing examples and you copied it and you modified it to do whatever your your kernel is supposed to be. Um, but there is a lot of boilerplate. This is primarily OpenCL's fault and both Silings and Intel have this issue that OpenCL sucks. And this is another cool thing that by moving to a framework such as DACE where the abstraction level is a little bit higher, all this crap is basically just emitted by the framework. So in the top here you see it, uh, creating the program um, from the from the bitstream, which essentially means reconfiguring the FPGA. Uh, it gets the kernel, it creates all the kernels with the right open cell arguments here on the bottom, um, launches the kernels and waits for the kernels to return. Like all this boilerplate code that you need to write every time you write a program. So all of that sort of goes away because uh, the abstraction level has been raised. And then there's the host device interaction. Uh, I already showed you this briefly, but essentially um, by having the memory copies expressed explicitly in the graph, this is all done transparently. So whenever there's a, a data flow edge that goes between a memory residing on the host to a memory that resides on the FPGA, the right memory copies are admitted and you don't need to worry about it. Um, uh, so for a program like this, it essentially emits what you see here. So that this is actually the emitted code from, from the graph here in the back where uh, you have some memory copies one direction, you run the kernel. But there's of course, of course a lot of code inside this days run kernel gem thing. And then the memory is copied back again. So all of this really just happens from, from this graph. So all this host device interaction stuff is also just gone and absorbed by the representation. So what you're left with is something like this. This is a, this is a days program. Um, 
you use one of these many front ends that I mentioned to make an STFG, STFG or our intermediate format here. And then the way you interact with it is you have to set, uh, if there are any, any um, variable sizes, you have to set them. Then you can, wait, here, <laughs> we, we uh, define it using one of our APIs. Then when you actually uh, call your program, you need to bind the, the inputs and outputs. And this is a gem, for example. So we bind the A, B, and C arrays, and we set some, um, some sizes, the N and K here. And in order to interface with your host, you basically just use NumPy. So um, this fully interfaces with NumPy, and, and we do all the, the um, matching to C++ arrays uh, within our code, and then, then call the underlying libraries. So that being said, um, this is this is sort of our preferred way of up, of operating with days because we like Python, but uh, these SDFGs also just uh, build and compile shared library files. So it's also perfectly valid to link this against some uh, C or C++ code and then call into the days program from whatever else you're doing. Um, but we like Python, so this is sort of how we mostly operate with it. So then I'll briefly just mention what the domain scientist here. Um, this is the other role that we talked about. Uh, so there are a bunch of ways you can you can write these programs, and and one recent one that we did is TensorFlow. So we essentially built a DSL on top of Days, which is specifically a stencil accelerator. So the input is just a JSON file where you specify some stencil operators and what fields they read, what they output, what data types they use, and what their boundary conditions, and then all of this gets pushed through the Days stack, and you get out a fast uh, FPGA program in the end. And then there's uh, significant work that's gone into neural networks, as you can imagine. That's where all the funding comes from. So there's a PyTorch front end, there's a TensorFlow front end, and um, um, Days operates on Onyx directly. Um, so so Onyx can be translated into these Days graphs and then optimized and and executed within the Days framework. And the FPGA support for that is currently uh, being rolled out slowly. Um, where you would essentially end up with being able to run your neural network from this PyTorch implementation. And the way this works is we also augmented this uh, this design with, with the concept of library nodes. So I showed you these very low level concepts of you had your little uh, sinus of, of X plus whatever, um, which, are, which are the sort of low level tasklets, but we also introduced the possibility to have high level constructs. So essentially you can have something like a matrix multiplication operator which we can then, within the framework, basically do what we call expand. So we take this, this node that represents some high-level thing, like a matrix multiplication, which is not a simple thing operating on one index, but we can represent it sort of from an abstract point of view and then expand it to something else. So for example, in this case here, if M is a matrix and V is a vector, we would be able to expand this to a matrix vector product. And then based on on what platform we're targeting, we could choose to expand this to a Kublas call, an Intel MKL call, or some uh, fast Silings FPGA implementation here with processing elements and so on. So with these, these additional libraries we build on top of it, we've built support for BLAS, um, so you can, you can call BLAS operations from within the framework. Uh, we do PyTorch and Onyx, like I mentioned, so Onyx operators are basically represented within, within the, the the graph representation, and then stencil flow for stencil programs. So you can you can plug in basically stencil operators, and and it will generate very fast code for that. And these work as either their own programs. You can write your PyTorch program or your stencil program, or you can also just take these and plug them into a program. So we we um, we've recently worked quite a lot on this this multi-level design, as we call it, where you can basically start from a high level, then you go into this this uh, domain specific. Uh, way of representing a program where you still have high level concepts like this is a matrix multiplication or this is a convolution, then you can do domain specific transformations on that and then later um, go into the low level representation and code generate it. This is inspired by MLIR, if any of you are familiar. And just to com come back to the results I briefly flashed in the beginning, so these are, are two different ways we expand stencil operators. So. Like I mentioned, there is a point where Silinx and Intel diverges a little bit in how you need to represent things to be fast. Um, for Stencil specifically, Intel uses this concept of shift registers, which is not 
supported in the same way on Xilinx. So we need to expand these dense operators in different ways. But the cool thing was that, that we did this, so we built this whole framework for stencils, which uh, had a lot of sort of a lot of infrastructure, a lot of code in it. And then in order to specialize this assigning so Intel, we only had to take the very last level of these expansions and specialize one to Silings and the other to Intel, because all the rest is handled by the code generator. And we essentially get the left hand side here for the Silings and the right hand side for Intel that operates on stencil buffers in different ways. And um I able to get very good performance results with this. Uh, just as a warning here, the Silings results are very early. This is basically something we did just before I went on holiday. So this will still improve, but essentially this is where we're getting our Teraflop performance on, on Stratix 10, so on the Intel uh, the Intel flagship. And, and so far we're up to 370 on Elveo. And I expect we're gonna go quite a lot higher once we've polished this a bit more for Silings because the initial representation was developed with Intel in mind. But the super cool thing here is that we built this this DSL. The DSL was initially tested for Intel. We just made a Silinx expansion for our stencil nodes instead, and then boom, we have full Silinx support as well. So really a huge benefit of working this level of abstraction is that the cross-platform comes either for free or very cheaply. And then just the last advertisement as well, there's actually now even a Visual Studio Code plugin for this. So you can open these graphs and you can view them and uh, um, uh, apply transformations directly through this interface and jump between the source code and the SDFG. Um, I don't think I have time to show you. Uh, we can see after uh, if there's a bit of extra time, but if you want, I can also give you a, a quick demo of what this looks like. This is super cool work by one of our students, Philip Shard, who made this awesome, awesome plugin, which basically means that now you're not only you're not only getting this high level abstraction, you're even getting an interactive graphical way of, of modifying and optimizing your FPGA programs. So just to briefly summarize why you should care about all this stuff I talked about just now. Um, the Motivating concept for all of this was separation, separating implementation optimization. So essentially you have an input program you want to optimize and then you can optimize it without messing up your input program. So if you decide later you wanna do something else, you wanna add an extra operator, wanna change your convolution, whatever, then that does not destroy all the optimizations you did and it's still actually possible to read your code. We optimize this using these reusable and extensible graph transformations. So I didn't talk about it so much, but uh, these transformations are it's completely possible to write your own. These FPGA transformations were some we wrote recently for a paper and the idea is really that, that you write stuff that is useful for you and then this can turn out to be useful for other applications, which we've seen many, many times already. Uh, we do cross-platform code generation. So you develop your program in this framework and then it, you can use whatever FPGA you feel like it. So. Also keep in mind, it's not only a question of Silings and Intel, it's also a question of uh, different Silings FPGAs, different Intel FPGAs, different versions of the tools, because all of this is absorbed in the framework. And then the way you program this is with these high-level Python interfaces. There are a lot of them. I didn't even cover all of them now. Um, there are lots of different ways of programming this, depending on how sort of um, how much of a power user you are and what kind of applications you, you use, um, including PyTorch and TensorFlow. So we have these really high level ways you can program things um, in addition to the sort of more more manual ways of programming it. And then we are now extending it with all these, these library functionality. So you also get a lot of these common operations for free, like your convolution, like your matrix multiplication and so on. And right now, um, probably next month, we're gonna have RTL support as well. So basically you can take your, your program you have HLS sections. Let's say you have a bunch of, of processing elements accessing memory, and then somewhere in the middle, you put in your RTL module uh, that you program manually because you need some very latency sensitive or very optimized implementation here, and it will just be compiled and run along with the rest. So this is already uh, working in, in, in our alphas, but we're sort of rolling it out into the main code base now. So yeah, thanks for listening. Um, just to just to make it clear, everything I've talked about now, this is completely free, it's open source, it's a research project, um, which means that this is constantly being developed for all the stuff that we do in the lab. And we 
really like to have users because that's why we do this. So if you're interested in this, I, I very much invite you to come check it out and see if you have a use case that that uh, that you can use days for. Um, if you do any sort of FPGA uh, programming in an HPC context, I promise you uh, this is useful for you if you want to spend the time to get into it. And uh, we're very keen on, on interacting with the community basically because um, we do this to help people developing HPC. So if we can help you, that means that we succeed essentially. And uh, the main paper of the project is here on the bottom, but there are now numerous publications that are spread off of this, of, of the various things that we do with it. So thank you for listening.